And I have a philosophy of it's the no but or yes if. No, I can't do that for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt, your host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive ROI from their investments in customer experience and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Mary Ellen Grom, who's the executive director of CX at AFL. Welcome, Mary. Great to be here. Thank you, Matt. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Uh, Mary Ellen, to get us started, um, you know, you have a a great background having worked in CX, both in an advisory capacity and at a company, um, AFL, which is a global B2B supplier in the energy and industrial space. To get us kicked off, I'd love to learn more about, um, as a CX leader in B2B, what do you see as your core focus to drive change and impact at AFL? You know, starting off, probably need to define my role Um, and how AFL looks at CX. As a B2B manufacturer, um, my role encompasses global marketing, inside sales, order entry, customer service, and operations. So pretty much um, a big piece of our commercial portfolio. I report into our EVP who also has outside sales. So between the two of us, we have the comprehensive uh, portfolio. And just for disclosures, our B2B customers here at AFL include direct customers in several markets, could be hyperscale, energy, industrial, service provider. Also, we work with distributors, several distributors, national distributors, and also manufacturer rep agencies. So that where the distributors stock our products, the manufacturer rep agents act as an extension of our sales team. So they're more boots on the ground and people out there um, taking the AFL brand into their customer bases as well. Has your focus always been so broad across marketing, sales and service, or has it expanded over time? It's expanded over time. So always thought I'd be a marketeer. uh, And that's what I did when I joined AFL in 2017. But as we made some changes uh, coming out of COVID, COVID obviously exploded our business. Um, We power the internet and we connect um, tele-education, telehealth. So imagine how the world changed during COVID and then after. And those changes led to um, some leadership shifts here inside the walls of AFL. And that's where I picked up the customer service inside sales order entry pieces and expanded the portfolio. In the customer experience space, some people um, start out on call centers. Some people start out more with digital. Some people start out with frontline. How do you see the different worlds coming together? And what are some of the learnings for you about taking that more holistic perspective? Yeah, that's been an interesting part of the last three-year journey is we are not a call center at AFL. And a lot of people have that perception. We do service service providers like AT&T, Verizon. A lot of those customers obviously operate in a B2C uh, call center environment. But here at AFL, we are true account managers. So we own the customer all the way from request for quote into shipping and delivery. So it's really looking at AFL as a trusted advisor, not as as customer service as you know it in the industry today, but really broadening the perspective and the roles and responsibilities of the team to take ownership of the customer from beginning to end and really trying to amplify their experience no matter where they are in that sales and purchase journey. Yeah, it's more from the customer success lens than the customer service lens, what you're describing. And um, how do you think about the journey your customers on then and and, and be, and creating those insights and connectivity so your people can help provide that more ownership of the full, full journey and the outcomes you want? Absolutely. Um, our journey is complex. <laughs> our sales cycle for so many of our products are built on a project basis, or it might be a blanket contract with 
with our customers to extend a partnership over time. It's not selling one and two widgets in the telecom industry, right? We are serving massive projects where we touch our customers at so many different points during the journey, whether it's that quoting phase, entering the order, booking the order, scheduling the order and getting it through our system, depending on whether it's it's materials that we're buying or products that we're making, right? It, it, it expands the whole dimension all the way down to what are we doing with the project to get it shipped and received. And depending on how large it is, is it going on flatbed trucks? How many reels are we looking at, right? Are we stacking things up on crates? And the weights and dims, it's crazy how much time we spend on what is it going to cost to ship this to you? And how is it going to ship to you? And because we have so many manufacturing facilities one of our biggest happens to be in Monterey, Mexico. Those products are shipped into our Laredo, Texas distribution center. So it's a complex supply chain and we're touching that customer every step of the way to reassure him or her, when are they going to get what they ordered from AFL? And, um, you know, it's not instant gratification. We have no e-commerce. Are again the complexity of the products that we sell really do not uh, allow us to sell those online. We do have some products that we're we're testing right now. Could we get those in an environment where we go to e-commerce? But right now everything is done through our sales team and customer service teams. What you're highlighting now is a common challenge for many B two B companies, which is that the supply chain and operations are a significant source of customer and employee effort in the customer journey. And building, tr building trust and reducing customer effort requires a lot of focus on the data and the operations and the human behavior throughout the supply chain, not just a big technology implementation. Absolutely. People process technology drives a lot of what we do within the walls of AFL. And we have grown so fast over the years and the manufacturing sector sometimes doesn't bring people and technology and process enhancements as quickly as we're trying to make product and get it out the door. So we've got some lagging efforts here at AFL. You know, I'm a firm believer that customer experience really isn't about fixing things, you know, whether it be those processes or upgrading and enhancing those tools, I'd rather be focusing on value proposition and really getting to the hearts, minds, and souls of our customers. But right now um, we do have some things that we have to fix, which kind of takes us backwards a little bit, but we know we have to take those steps backwards to be able to take leaps and bounds going forward to really get to the value proposition with our customers. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of moments in the journey where um, getting them to be smoother, getting them to be uh, right, um, is has an emotional impact on the different personas that you're interacting with. And you're, you're, you want to make sure those experiences are smooth Otherwise, it's hard to make the value proposition and that emotional peak come through because you're dealing with problems. Yes, absolutely. And we're believers that you can't not have an experience. No matter who's dealing with AFL, you're going to have an experience. And it's a little different because they're not the end consumer of the product. And it's high tech and it's telecom. It's it's nowhere near a consumer product, but at the end of the day, our reputation is on the line with those customers who buy from AFL. I mean, our reputation and the quality of our products, the safety environments in which we build our products, those create kind of that emotional attachment. And even though some of them are very heavy duty, durable products, 
a lot of them aren't sexy, let's just be honest, but you'd be surprised how passionate not only our people, but our customers get for delivering the right product at the right time to the right place. And it really does spark that emotion, even though it's not a consumer product. How do you think about meaning then, like the meaning that you're having for your customers and the impact that it has, you know, uh, that your experience has for them and that what drives that emotional connection? Definitely. At AFL, you know, we want to make it difficult not to do business with AFL. That's our number one goal. We want to give every reason in the world to, to continue doing business with us, not just start doing business and not just a one-off project, but create customers for life. Because obviously the technology that we're in, it's not going anywhere. And the industries that we serve, there's not a lot of industries that we're not in today. Our enterprise market is so broad and so deep, whether it's education or healthcare or finance or transportation, every market has a reason to do business with AFL. And that's where we believe we can create that loyalty. So who do you think of then as the customer, like as customers or people? not just companies, like who do you think of as the persona, as the customers that you're interacting with? Yeah, it it changes by market, it changes by product. Obviously we deal a lot in a very technical space. So our applications engineering team, our technical engineering teams, our technical support teams are a critical part of that customer journey because there's a lot of people here who, who do that job and nobody wants to touch it, right? We, we kind of say our customer account representatives could almost do any job in the company because we touch every, every persona, whether it's a purchasing agent, it could be a sales team at our manufacturing rep agent, it could be a distributor sales rep, doesn't matter your title, but other than engineering, you, you need a good degree to be an engineer. And those are the, the guys and gals who can really, really make a difference. And we send them to customer site visits. We'll send them to construction sites, to install environments, because they can really, really make a difference. And while they're there, they're also training on our products, how to install them, how to course correct them how to mitigate or troubleshoot if there are issues, which of course there's no issues with AFL products, right? (laughs) Everything's flawless when we're out in the field. (laughs) So when you engage with these different personas, um, how much are you thinking about what's different across them versus what's common across them that makes AFL's brand promise resonate? Like what's the right balance between what's the same across the personas and the experience versus how you're trying to tailor it for different personas? That's a dilemma for us because we do have to customize. Uh, It's one of our, it's a blessing and a curse here at AFL because we want to create customized products, solutions, and services for the customer need to solve their problem. But at the same time, when you lead an organization that goes across all geographies, all business units, all markets, there's got to be some level of standardization. Otherwise, how do we train people? It's just, um, it's, it's one of those blessing curse kind of scenarios where we want to personalize the experience for our customers. But obviously, if we're dealing with a direct customer versus a distributor, the distributor needs to know how to sell it, whereas the direct customer is probably going to need to know how to install it or to tweak it, to troubleshoot it, to um, to make it work, to turn it on. Depends on on the environment that we're in. And that's why training, learning, and education is extremely critical. Our installation instructions are extremely detailed. We've moved, obviously, to a more video-based installation instructions because we're in that world. People want to see it happen. Don't tell me how to do it. Show me how to do it. So it's difficult. It's a challenge that we face every day trying to customize and personalize for the customer, 
but at the same time, scale our business operations around the globe. Yeah, it's interesting uh, trade-off you're highlighting, Mary Ellen, about you know, the, uh, beyond the products and the operations that you're making sure suit the needs of your customers. Um, and that come through in your marketing and your sales. And um, there's the way you deliver that expertise and information and content your customers need to, to, to deal with their unique situation, like you said, that they, they have different needs. And historically, a lot of companies rely on the expertise of their people to deliver that and that, and, now we, and the right behaviors of their people and the right inf- expertise. And now we're seeing the ability to tailor the content more when we have more data about the customer and we have more ability in the interaction to tailor the experience. How are you thinking about like the human to human as a way of delivering the experience versus trying to use content and data to tailor the experience? Sure. Um, You know, at the end of the day, people buy from people. Uh, We can make things all day long, but our, our products don't get to our customers without the involvement of AFL associates around the globe. And when you talk about customer experience, you know, customer experience is fueled by employee experience. And if you have trusted, enabled, empowered, engaged associates who are confident in doing their job every day, that is going to translate into a better experience for our customer no matter where they may be or or what part um, of the buying journey that they're in. So EX and CX, are, are they equal, right? And we spend a lot of time really dissecting that and really trying to figure out, do we have the right people in the right roles uh, to serve our customers? The human touch is, it is so much a part of what we try to do every day at AFL. And as we talk about e-commerce and even customer portals, our customer portal is authenticated. You can't buy on that tool, but you can do order status. You can uh, get expedites on your shipping or get tracking information. Um, So hopefully it cuts down on the amount of customer transactions coming into my organization But at the same time, we have so many customers who have such an affinity and a relationship with their sales rep, whether it be the inside rep, the outside rep, our customer service team, doesn't matter. They want to deal with humans. So we have to make ourselves available for that. So, But so much of our transactions are email driven, not phone driven, believe it or not. The outside team has more communication phone, and we're more email driven. And they're, of course, face to face. There are boots on the ground every day visiting customers in and out all all over the place. So I love what you're saying about the EX CX connection. I mean, that's the name of the podcast, the CX and culture connection, which is all about how humans drive a great CX. Um, And um, I'd love to get your thoughts, Mary Ellen, about how do you raise that consciousness of your employees of a good CX? You know, whether through whether it's through training, or through um, giving them tools, or or other things to be able to make sure your employee experience impacts the CX. Yes, absolutely. So you know, because customer experience is in my title, everybody thinks I own it. And my standard answer to that is no one owns customer experience. We all own it. It doesn't matter where you sit in the organization. If you're in HR, yes, you have a different customer. You've got, you've got associates and future associates, right? If you're in finance, you're dealing with different people inside the walls of our customer organizations, but you still touch that customer, So we all need to look inside and define customer experience for our role in the organization. And I'll be honest, AFL has has talked a lot. There's been a lot of rhetoric rhetoric around CX, but we've recently had some leadership changes and some internal strategic planning that is really driving AFL to make CX a differentiator. 
and put people and treasure and talent behind our CX efforts and, and really get to what we're calling a true score or a true measure. And it's not just CSAT or customer SAT or a, a, a score, if you will. Every single team in the company is right now defining how are we going to measure it? And then all those measures will roll up into a dashboard because, again, those metrics are going to be different depending on where you sit in the organization. So, you know, our core values, our core values every single day drive what we believe. And then we have a set of six operating principles that drive how we behave. So internally, we look at our own beliefs and our own behaviors and act those out every day. And and hopefully our customers can see that every step of the way, because that will translate into an ultimate experience for them, for sure. Wow, there's so much... um insightful um, elements in what you just said. I want to unpack it a little bit for our audience and and encourage them to like and subscribe. And, and I also can highlight some other podcasts in a minute that have touched on some of the themes uh, that you just talked about. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, one thing you talked about was measurement and building a system of met- metrics and getting beyond NPS or CSAT or customer efforts score, whatever. There is no golden metric is what we're both saying, <laughs> right? And that you, while those metrics can be useful, ultimately you're trying to drive business outcomes. Exactly. And so, and so you want to have business outcomes as your ultimate metric, and those are going to vary across the organization. There's not one business outcome you care about, although you may have one that's really important, but there are probably several, a balanced scorecard. Um, and different stakeholders will care about a particular outcome. And the key in CX is to link your insights to that outcome so you drive impact. Um, that's the way to get people on, on board is to show that you're helping them right? And collaborate. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's one fertile area we could dive into is like, how is the practice of measurement and evolving? And how do you do this in a way that reflects the diversity across the company and their sub journeys and their different outcomes and dashboards that get created for that getting beyond just listening, right? Um, another um, fertile area is this notion of behavior and like, translating that at the employee level into something that's actionable, which you were talking about, about like, what are the values, what are the behaviors? A a number of times in our conversation, you've been emphasizing a human beings behaving in the right way as a way of delivering the CX. And there are things you can do to drive habit building. So for example, um, you know, people could check out the podcast I had with Chris Taylor from Actionable, uh, which was all about habit building, right? Um, and if they want to dive deeper into um, the emotion side, they could check out the podcast with Luke Carbone, who I know that you've worked with as well in the past, um, um, and uh, and so forth. So um, you know, um, I, I'd love to kind of come back to whichever those two themes you want to dive deeper into to next: the behavior or the measurement. I think definitely behavior. Um... Measurement is so new to us. We measure a lot of things, but CX is new territory. And again, we're all right now, our fiscal year end is March 31st. So we are right on the cusp and everybody's got sights set high on CX as, as a trigger and as a measurement. But at the end of the day, we also can't lose sight of the business metrics that make our operations run. Uh, day in and day out, and how do we combine those and not get hung up so much on on the fix? Because I've seen it happen so many times is you try to get to root causes of what needs to get fixed within the company that sometimes you take your, your eyes off the customer experience as you're trying to fix it. It's kind of a, a dichotomy that... Um, can get us into trouble if we're not cognizant of that as we go down that path. What are some examples of, um, you know, 
stepping back and thinking about how the broader picture and the, the, the behaviors of your employee is distinct from just kind of focusing on the metrics? What are, can you help, help bring this to life a little bit? What you mean by, you know, uh, things can go differently and, and how you need to take a broader lens? I think some of it is um, becoming more of a collaborative, cross-function, cross-geography organization and breaking down some of our silos our organizational structure by business unit and by market. Our sales team is segmented by market and our business units, obviously, by the products that they make. And those silos have got in our, we, we've become our own worst enemy at times. And we just had an extended leadership meeting about a month ago. And there were seven people in that room that I've worked with since day one at AFL. And I just met for the first time because we've also been a company that stays where we work. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who who visit our different locations, but it hasn't been accepted as widely as I think it is going forward. We've got to learn each other's cultures. We've got to learn how we work. We call it walking a mile in other shoes. You have to really have an appreciation for other people's roles in the organization because there's no one person that is making AFL successful. There are so many people in the ecosystem from that request for quote all the way to shipping and receiving to that customer or on location at their site. So breaking down those silos, increasing collaboration, crystal clear communication and more communication. We've also been accompanying, it's, it's odd, we're in telecommunications, but sometimes we forget to communicate throughout our own organization, which, which creates gaps. And it, it puts speed, speed bumps all through the organization because then people are left to make their own assumptions. And that, that can be dangerous. We all know how dangerous that can be. What you're highlighting is there are many potential breakdowns that could be a root cause of a customer experience opportunity, either to fix a problem or to enable something better. Mm -hmm. Um and understanding, you know, what are those root causes is helpful, you know, wh whether it's the skills of the people, the process needs to change, people aren't sharing information. These are all human things that occur that like accumulate, like you say, in a company and you can, you know, you can collaborate on addressing them. How do you think about um, your role as a change agent then? you know, of, of like working, identifying and working on helping drive change to overcome some of these barriers that are not just, you know, fixing the product or getting better, you know, content to communicate. Change management and becoming change agents as opposed to change averse. It's definitely uh, a part of who we have to become. We have so many people at AFL who have been with us. We're celebrating, um, starting April 1st, our, our 40th anniversary in business. And we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Fujikura out of Tokyo, Japan. So a lot of our products come from our Fujikura parent and we're, we're in constant communication with them. So when you talk about change, again, sometimes AFL, <laughs> we're our own worst enemy um, because we have that mentality, if it's not broken, then why fix it? Well, sometimes it's, it's really innovative and creative and radical to, to break it if it's not broken already because you can get new ideas out of that or new pathways to solve problems or new product innovations just kind of depends on um, the situation you're in for a customer. But change is, is something that we deal with every single day. And again, to implement new technologies and process and procedure internally, it changes the way we do things. We just went through a huge Salesforce configure price quote, CPQ implementation over six months. 
And, you know, that causes disruption to your normal business. You have got to do your job and keep the lights open while at the same time completely turning your process and procedure upside down to, to serve that customer. So it makes it really difficult for especially the customer facing individuals throughout the organization um, to keep that change in motion, but also not create uh, turmoil for our customers. It's a delicate balance, that's for sure. I mean, it sounds like some of your time spent as a change agent is dealing with big events that you know may occur, well, maybe events, the wrong word, initiatives, uh, where there's like a, a CPQ effort or a new product launch or something's occurring that there's a longer time associated with maybe six months or longer to implement. And you're helping make sure that uh, that initiative goes is well executed um, and has the right impact on the customer experience, collaborating with other functions in the organization, depending on the initiative. Is, is a lot of your time spent on initiatives or is it spent on kind of the um, uh, continuous improvement? What's the right balance for you between initiatives and like the bold bets versus the brilliant basics? Yeah, yeah, um, it's a little bit of both. Every minute of the day, I can't say, obviously on some days I'm driving uh, core initiatives. We've identified three major inflection points that are just transformative for for AFL, and we've developed uh, core teams that are really getting in and dissecting those initiatives. Those are the kinds of goals and aspirations, and we need to prioritize because when nothing's a priority, everything becomes a priority. And then all of a sudden, when the organization is working on everything, nothing's getting done well. And We've grown up as a company that executes by brute force, and we always want to do everything that we can for the customer, and we find it hard to say no. That's part of the change management as well is how do you get to the point where you feel comfortable telling a customer no? And I have a philosophy of it's the no but, or yes, if, no, I can't do that for you, but here's what I can do. Uh, have or you yes. done improv? Have you done improv? Improv? This is like, yes, yes and. You yeah, always want to say, yes. yeah, you always want to say yes. yes, and, yeah. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about, but no improv. But the yes, if, no, but is so strong because there's times where you have to walk away from something to be able to, to be your best for the right priorities. And it, it, it's, it's an art and a science to make that work. And our sales teams are brilliant at that. Obviously, they're out in the field all day long, tackling those challenges and opportunities that, that come their way. So it, it really is a balance. Thanks for sharing that. Um, what you've got me thinking, Mary Ellen, is... Um, couple things. One is, you know, what you're highlighting is, is the importance of having a roadmap with clear priorities so that you can focus your CX investments and get alignment on a few initiatives that really matter and focus people's energy on governing and driving them. Otherwise, it's a constant game of whack-a-mole chasing chasing, you know, scores and chasing data, you know, you know, issues that come up in your NPS or CSAT which ultimately is a lot of consumes a lot of energy for less impact than if you had a clear roadmap with alignment and a, and a few priority initiatives to drive impact from CX. So that's really good that you're driving, like you said, three big initiatives and you've got the right people engaged. It's cross-functional. So that's awesome. Um, the other area is culture, uh, which is that we've been talking about this, that the behaviors in the organization impact your success on driving CX and EX, employee experience, and how they come together. Um, and often a company's strengths become its weaknesses. So you, you're, you, you behave a certain way, like the heroic efforts and always wanting to get it done. That's actually a manifestation of traits in your organization that are positive 
contributing to behaviors that can actually become like a problem building up that you want to drive change and, and get more focus because the strengths overplayed, right? Okay. Um, that's usually the case when there's a weakness, it's actually, uh, an, uh, an, it's actually an, an overshooting of a, a strength becoming a weakness because people play, learn to do things a certain way because of positive reinforcement. Yeah. And in, cult in culture, then you can pay attention to, if you understand and are self-aware, these are the behaviors that we want in the organization. More, you highlighted some more collaboration, more sharing of information, uh, more uh, measurement of outcomes, you know, outcomes versus inputs. Like what are the right behaviors in the organization then then you can actually try to deliberately reinforce them as a leader of CX to get kind of push on the behaviors that drive results. In your case, you're, you, you emphasize collaboration a few times. Mm -hmm. Those are behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. actions that we have to be cognizant of and not just talk about them, but actually do them. We can talk about communication and talk about collaboration, conflict resolution all day long, but we have to put it in practice. And, and not just read about it and theorize about it, but actually do it. And as leaders throughout the organization, we have to practice what, what we're preaching. And I think that's a big part of our transformation internally and our, our change management for sure. Yeah, I'd like to focus on the distinction between direct and indirect approaches where direct is uh, for behavior, for direct is like it's directly touching the customer. And like, as you highlighted, there's, there's people across the organization, even in finance that you mentioned who touch the customer, but the way your people show up and behave with the customer has a direct impact on the customer experience. It's more obvious in consumer, if you think about like Starbucks or Ritz Carlton or something like that, there's a, or Disney, there's a human interaction where they're known as exemplars, where the way that employees engage with the customer, their, their direct behavior with the customer has a huge impact on delivering on the brand promise. Indirect is actually really important also in all companies, but especially in B2B, because you have all this complexity where now the way your employees behave, the way they, they engage with each other actually has an impact on the customer, the way you design a product, the way you manage the supply chain. These are actually, you're designing a process, designing an experience, and those that's an indirect impact um, rather than a direct impact. And that's also behavior. And uh, uh, if you do quality management or design thinking or human-centered design, you're impacting these indirect behaviors. What do you think is the next uh, big opportunity in CX? What gets you excited to, that you think there's innovation, things happening, whether it's AI or new tech or something else that doesn't have to be AI that you think is exciting and you're, you're, you're enjoying spending more time there because of the potential it has to impact CX? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, AI, technology, new process enhancements, robotic process automation, whatever you want to call it, right? It gets, um, it gets to the hearts of our customers and it's allowing us to dig deeper, not just their voices and their, and their minds, um, kind of bridging the gap if the chasm, I don't think it's a gap, I guess it's more of a chasm between the marketing side, that world that I live in, and then over on the customer service inside sales order entry side, what I've seen is automation at a different level for marketing and the digital transformation that we've had through marketing automation platforms, whether it be our sprout social media monitoring and listening tools that we use, um, the advanced search technologies that we have on our websites. You know, we've been working in that world for the last 10 years. But here at AFL, that type of technology is so new on the customer service sales order entry side. So really starting to sit down and dissect bot generated communication because where can we use the the thoughts and the strategic qualities of our teammates 
and turn over bot generated communication or automated systems that take some of that manual tedious effort out of our out of our processes and at first it makes people think oh, my heavens what's going to happen to me if you automate portions of what i do every day well then that will translate into a better experience for customers because we have more time to serve them directly as opposed to working within to get the job done. So we have quite a few projects going on right now. Order entry automation. We automated last year some of our customer communications on lead times. Obviously coming out of the pandemic, the supply chain impact was, was grandiose. And we had to get information to our customers when they would receive what they ordered. And we were doing that manually through the sales team, through customer account representatives. And we thought, well, if we could take our system data and, and get that communication, whether it's good news or bad news, our customers are pretty transparent. They just want to know what's going on. It's when when we don't tell them that what's going on, it creates that bad experience. So using technology to do some of those simple tasks and really cut down on the number of requests inbound to the organization. We're, we're looking at ways to do that across our website. Today, the only chat environment we have on our website is through our careers page that you wanna follow up on an application or make an inquiry about an open job that is posted on our website, but we've got to get to the point where some of that technology is assisting us in the customer service and sales world as well. It's a huge opportunity you're highlighting, Mary Ellen, to improve the ease of doing business, both for the customer and internally. Right to free up the time to reinvest in delivering that value proposition, right? That's right. And, and also these interactions can be optimized with journey orchestration and journey analytics. That the, the, what's great, just like social media is both content and insights. Right. Me messaging is actually both content and insights. You can mine all this unstructured data and optimize uh, the experience leveraging it. So this is a huge frontier, just like you can mine the contact centers and the social media, the messaging is massively growing and is a huge opportunity, not just to automate and simplify, but to build even more insights than you get from surveys. That's exactly right. Go deeper into um, what customers are thinking about or feeling as they go through those different stages in the journey. It's a huge part of it. And we can't lose sight too, although it's not my, my swim lane, but our plant operations are constantly looking at ways to incorporate new industry 4.0 technology and best practices. We have an initiative called AFL Manufacturing Excellence, where our plant operations teams are sitting side by side with companies right here in upstate South Carolina to rub elbows with best practice leaders in manufacturing excellence. Because sometimes the best way to learn, even though the products are different, these are not fiber optic cable and accessories manufacturers, but they might be textiles or automotive or aerospace and sharing across manufacturing operations to really glean the insights that will make us better. Because if we can get it faster, quicker, safer, at, at a better price than our competition, it's going to make us better for our customers every day. Well, I, I definitely... Um feel like you've sparked some great ideas for me. And I know we could keep going for a while and I would enjoy that, but I, I want to um, you know, close out our discussion by just asking um, what's the best way if people want to get in touch for, with you or, or follow up, is it over LinkedIn? What's, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn's my social platform of choice, very, very active there. 
Um, obviously, if you need information about AFL, aflglobal.com is our website. Those are probably the two primary, depending on whether you need contact with me or AFL. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. And I, again, encourage everyone to like and subscribe. And if you want to check out some of the other podcasts, um, I guess, or my book, go to um, www.cxandcultureconnection.com. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen, for such a wonderful, insightful conversation. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's been great. Thank you so much, Matt. <laughs>